Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. I thank you for the weather that we can experience. I thank you for the coolness to come, Lord. I thank you that you have given us grace, Lord, and mercy and working in our lives in such a way to bring us here on this Sunday morning together as a church. And Lord, I pray that we would recognize our dependence on you. I pray, Lord, I would recognize my dependence on you in preaching today, Lord. I need you and I pray that we would recognize our dependence, Lord, in needing you to work these truths upon our heart, Lord. I pray that they would impact our lives um, in such a meaningful way as to uh, help us to take steps closer to you in faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I want to talk to you today and uh, explain to you two experiences that I have had in my past with relationships with other Christians. My friend Andy, I met him in sometime in 2008. Um, in 2008, I was a very different person. I was in a bad place in many different ways. Um, but even though Andy and his family knew about the drugs, even though they knew about the other bad decisions I was making, they continued as a family to invite me to dinner. They continued as a family to, well, not as a family, Andy would continue to try to work out with me. I uh, liked working out occasionally back then as well. Um, and most importantly, they continued to work with me and talk to me about Christ. Um, I still have the copy of Desiring God by John Piper that Andy gave me back then. And even though I didn't care to read it then, um, it's impacted my life in the future. And I got saved, and I got to know Andy even better. He used to come and meet with me weekly on Thursdays at church, and then we would talk about our faith and what we were struggling with and just life. And, you know, even today, he calls me on Thursdays. He called me this past Thursday. And that was even amidst a time where, you know, his mom just passed away. And I've had many other relationships with Christians. Another example I remember that impacted me and my family. Uh, we had a family in our church that was very close to us. They homeschooled as we homeschooled, they were actually very impactful in praying for me when uh, I was far from the Lord. They served as our youth directors in church, and one day they left without saying anything. Uh, they quit and never talked to our family much again. And that left us feeling hurt. Um, it left us feeling betrayed, abandoned. And even I was talking to my mom about it yesterday, and this is, you know, maybe seven years ago, and I was talking to her yesterday, and she said, you know, it still impacts uh, your dad and I today. And so maybe in your life, thinking about the relationships you've had with Christians, maybe you've had your Andes, hopefully, and maybe you've had your betrayals, I hope not. But what has your experience been with building close relationships with Christians? Maybe you've had a great experience with building close relationships with Christians. Maybe you've tried to build close relationships, but nothing ever seems to stick. Uh, maybe you're likely you don't try anymore because of the hurt you've experienced when you've opened up to other Christians, or the witness of other Christians, the way they've treated you or others in the past. Or maybe you just don't have much of a desire to connect to other Christians alone. You consider yourself an introvert. You're happier in your house. <laughs> I tend to lean that way. Uh, maybe you know quite a few Christians, but you're just not that close to them, any of them. And in my own experience, you know, in addition to the examples I shared with you, I can think of times 
I've been hurt. I can think of times that I've hurt others, unfortunately. I can think of times I've been apathetic about knowing other Christians, and times I've been enthusiastic about knowing other Christians. And whatever the case is for you and your life right now, what I'm trying to help us consider today is why keep trying to make connections with other believers, to build close relationships with other believers. Why is it worth it? Why start trying? Our vision for this year, as you've heard the last couple of weeks, is that we want to be a church community who, that loves like Jesus. And when we look at Jesus' example in the Gospels, what we see clearly is that Jesus' love actively caused him to seek close relationships. And in understanding this point, if you don't get the first part of this point, you will miss it all. And that is that Jesus' love is what caused him to make close relationships with others. And why is this the case? Well, this is the case first because Jesus loves because God is love. It's a part of his very being. If you look at 1 John 4, 16, this is what John writes, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. So he says we believe the love that God has for us. God is is love. He's describing who God is and goes on, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And furthermore, this is why we see God act in loving ways in Scripture. If you, uh, God acts in loving ways because God is loving. In John 15, 9, Jesus talking about the love between him and the Father, this is what he says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. So Jesus acts in loving ways by loving us. Why? Because the Father loved him. There's a love between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the greatest proof of this, proof of God's love, is the gospel. Jesus says in John 14, 31, and we'll be going through quite a few scripture verses, so... uh, it would probably be helpful to write them down. But John 14, 31, Jesus says, but that the world may know that I love the Father. So he's trying to get the world to know that he loves the Father. How is he doing that? And as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Jesus was sent, he did, so that the world would know the love of the Father. And we're very familiar with this, you know, in a passage like John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, how did he show his love? That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you know, we're talking here about loving like Jesus, but it's crucial that you understand that you can't love like Jesus before you love Jesus. Or you must love Jesus in order to love like Jesus. And as we saw, God so loved us by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Uh, He took the punishment for our sins upon Himself and suffered and died. And after three days, He rose from the dead, which demonstrated His victory over sin and death. And he's calling us, he's calling you, he's calling me to devote ourselves to him in faith, to believe in him. And so I urge you today, if you have not given your life to Christ by believing in what he has done for you on the cross, I urge you to do that because you can't love like Jesus until you love Jesus. But ultimately, this gospel, this work of Christ on the cross, it teaches us about who God is. When we see how God has acted in the past, we learn about who He is. Who is His being? What is He like? When Scripture tells us who God is, we can expect Him to act in ways that match 
who he is. And so we see this all over the Bible. Uh, Sometimes the Bible will tell us that God did something, like think, for example, that God delivered the Israelites from Egypt. And from that deliverance, we learn he delivered them because he loves them. Another way to ask it would be, what kind of God would deliver a people from oppressors? A loving God. Again, you look in Scripture and you see statements talking to us about who God is. God is love, and then we can think about what kind of ways would a loving God act. And we know, as I've said, that He acted in the most loving way by sending Christ to die for us, but we also can have confidence that because He is a certain way, because He has acted a certain way, He will act a certain way in the future. And obviously, both of these are true regarding love. Scripture teaches us that God is love and describes the various loving acts that God has done throughout history. And so, ultimately, we can say that Jesus loves because He is love. His whole mission to earth was fueled by love because it most glorified or praised God by revealing who God is. And it was this very love that caused him to actively seek close relationships. And so we're going to look at the Gospels and see how this played itself out in the life of Jesus. And this happened, these close relationships happened at many different levels of closeness. Uh, Before it happened at the closest levels, you know, it happened at a broader surface level. As Jesus sought to build relationships with people through serving them. Um, Even if you think about number one, we'll see here that his love caused him to spend time with the crowds. And how did Jesus do this? Well, first, he did something so simple as he fed them. He met their physical need for food. In Matthew 15, 32, now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude." Then he answers, why? Why does he have compassion? Because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. So his compassion, his love caused him to feed them. He also healed their sick in Matthew 14, 14, and when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. If you also think of something like the wedding at Cana, you know, why did Jesus spend miraculous power changing water to wine? And it has to be in part because he wanted them to have a better wedding. He was concerned for their joy at the wedding. But ultimately, even though he met physical needs, he healed sick, he fed people, he was concerned to feed them spiritually. If you look at Matthew 9, 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Why? Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And so these examples demonstrate a God who was concerned so much for the people Not that he just skipped everything and only taught them truth, but he met whatever need he could because he cared for them, because he loved them. And it was this love, this very being that caused him to actively seek these close relationships. And we also see that his love caused him to form close relationships with his disciples. If you remember first, it's Uh, less spoken about in the Gospels, but Jesus had a group of 70 disciples that were closer to him than maybe the crowds. In Luke 10, 1, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. So he had this group of 70, but even closer than the 70, Jesus chose 12 men to be his close disciples. These are the ones we're most familiar with. Luke 6, 13 through 15 says, and when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. This is probably the bigger group. 
and from them he chose twelve, whom he named, also named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot. And so Jesus chooses these twelve men to be his disciples, and I want you to think about what did life look like with these twelve disciples? Well, Jesus traveled with them. Jesus taught them. He taught them to pray. He taught them to teach. He taught them to heal. He taught them to cast out demons. He also went through dangerous situations with his disciples. If you think of uh, them going through the storm together on the boat, or if you think of them coming to the, I can't remember his name, but one of the demon-possessed men who was clearly dangerous. They were going through these tense, difficult situations together because they lived together. Jesus lived with his disciples. He served his disciples by washing their feet. He even confessed his sorrow to his disciples. Listen here in Matthew 26, 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So he hasn't told them yet. He has begun to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then, then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And if you remember, unfortunately, they sleep. But these points, this level of closeness that Jesus had with his disciples it demonstrates that Jesus was committed to spending time with them, to living life with them, to building close relationships with them. He was committed to it, and this was because of his love. But even though he had 12 disciples, his love caused him to be closest with only three of them. And we see this as John is described as the disciple that Jesus loved in John 13, 23. We also see in Matthew 17, 1, uh, Jesus' transfiguration. And he didn't take the whole group. He took three of them. Matthew 17, 1, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Only Peter, James, and John. His brother led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And finally, only Peter especially has a place of prominence. In Matthew 16, 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And so Jesus' love and his love caused him, moved him, drove him to form these close relationships with his disciples. But he didn't limit it just to his disciples. There were others in his life, even on earth, that he was close to. Jesus is said to love Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in John 11.5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. In John eleven thirty five, 35, after Lazarus dies, Jesus weeps. And then in the next verse, then the Jews said, because of his weeping, see how he loved him. So his weeping, his sorrow demonstrated his love, demonstrated his closeness with Lazarus. When John the Baptist died, Jesus was also uh, affected in Matthew fourteen thirteen. When Jesus heard of it, the death of John, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. He needed some alone time. But when the, deci- when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And lastly, Jesus even allowed a woman to anoint his feet. In Luke seven thirty eight. Um, This is just a very interesting uh, scene that appears weird to me, to be honest. (laughs) But uh, Luke 7, 38, 
talking about this woman, and, and she stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. So Jesus wasn't so high and mighty as to not allow this woman demonstrate her repentance and worship to him. He was close to her. He was close to people because he loved them. It's not that Jesus was obligated to love people. It's not that he loved people because it was the right thing to do. He loved them because he truly desired to have a relationship with them. He truly desires to have a relationship with you. He truly desires to call you his friend. I heard this week uh, this passage from uh, Jamie Smith. He preached uh, for the youth group and for Wednesday night. And this is a great passage, John 15, 13. Um, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another." And so Jesus' love caused him to get close, close to the crowds. But at one point, they tried to throw him off a cliff. At another point, at the pinnacle of his mis- ministry, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And ultimately, he was crucified. The disciples initially forsook him. And one of the closest, one of those three, Peter, denied him three times, and Judas, one of the other disciples, betrayed him. But it was worth it. Jesus didn't love because of the response he would get or the response he wouldn't get from people. He loved because he is love, and he had lovingly created mankind in his image. Valuable, uh, regardless of the choices they made and the choices we have made and the choices we will make because of the lasting influence of sin in our lives, his love caused him to actively seek close relationships. It was demonstrated, it was proven, it was evidenced by these close relationships with the crowds, with the disciples, with Mary and Martha even when the closest betrayed him. And really, it's no difference, different for us. And that's why we say, loving like Jesus will move us to know and be known by our church community. Notice here that this second statement has one thing in common with the first, and that's the love of Jesus. We love like Jesus because he first loved us, because he loved us. In John 13, 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give you that you love one another. So he commands us to love. Then he says, As I have loved you. So you love one another like I have loved. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so the love that we have for one another is supposed to prove to the world that we are disciples of Christ. And what kind of love do we have? It's a Christ-like love, as I have loved you. It's a love like Jesus. Uh, Paul says, something very similar in 2 Corinthians 5.14. He says, For the love of Christ compels us. It motivates us. It moves us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. Why? That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The love of Christ 
compels us because of the gospel, because of him dying on the cross for us. And finally, Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, Paul again says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ has also loved us, and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. And so we love as Christ has loved. We love because Christ has loved us. And this is why we say, you know, we have in the atrium, we have the poster out there with our values, and we try to take those seriously and make our decisions based on those values. And one of them is gospel motivation. And we say the gospel is for every person at every moment. And these passages perfectly illustrate this. The gospel motivates us to love. The love of Christ is the reason, the impetus for us to love one another, to be known and know one another in our lives. The gospel motivates us to love, and we move on. Loving like Jesus will move us to know and be known. Now, why is this true? I think it's true at the simplest level because you don't love what you don't know. Uh, Seeking to love or to know others demonstrates that you love them and provides you more opportunity to love them. I was thinking, you know, because I know my wife, I know better how to show love for her. I know not to cook her fish for dinner, uh, but maybe chicken instead would be a better choice. Um, I know what to buy her for Christmas. I know how to spend time with her because I know her. If I didn't know her, it'd be hard to love her. But even at a deeper level, those are some superficial examples. They're still meaningful. But at a deeper level, I understand and I'm able to be there for her through her joys, through her fears, through her afflictions and difficulties because I know her. And in the same way, you can't be loved if you're not willing to be known by others. If my wife, you know, refused to disclose her food preferences to me, I'd probably cook fish. Wouldn't end up well. Um, But on, on an even deeper level, refusing to share joys, sorrows, fears, sins, suffering keeps you from one of the main tools that God has designed for your sanctification in Christ. You won't grow as God has designed you to grow unless you're known by others. God uses the love of others to help you to grow, and we'll see that in several passages of Scripture in a moment. But before that, let's consider what does it mean to be known? What does it mean to be known? Um, if you do, if you read a bit about the philosophical trends that created the culture that we live in now, um, you'll understand that being an authentic, autonomous individual is crucial to the world that we live in right now. Um, one philosopher said it this way. He said, in modernity, which is in part the time we're in now, Uh, We remade the human person into a buffered self. What does that mean? Protected and autonomous and independent, free to determine our own good and pursue, pursue our own authentic path. We shut out incursions of the divine and demonic to carve out a privatized space to be free on our own terms. But then he says... The price that we paid was sealing ourselves off in a cell. We thought we were our own liberators. Turns out we might be our own jailers. And you might see this or feel this when you think, I'm most authentic when I make my own decisions that are different from the crowd. I need to be my own independent person. Or I'm truly free as an individual when I'm not weighed down by other people. Other people just hinder me 
from who I can be. Or even on a more basic level, you might think, as I've often thought, I'm just an introvert. It's just the way I am. I'm a private person. Is what it is. But that's not being known according to Scripture. Uh, Being known is also opposite to a prideful transparency. Uh, This is a way of focusing on self that does not understand boundaries and, you know, shares all over the place. Or maybe someone who's always concerned about sharing their difficulties and trials with everybody else, but never being willing to actually address them and make meaningful decisions to change. Scripturally, being known is the opposite to both of these. It's the opposite to being closed off. It's the opposite to a prideful transparency. It's the opposite to both of those things. Being known, according to Scripture, is a humble transparency. And what does that mean? It means being open at appropriate levels with other believers about your sorrow, joy, fear, hopes, and sin. And how do you spot the difference? You know, what does it look like in practice to be humbly transparent rather than pridefully transparent? And I think the main difference is purpose. Why are you being transparent? Or why are you being uh, quiet? at that particular time? Is your reason for doing those things that you are trying to be closer to Christ or closer to loving others, or is your reasoning more of a selfish motivation? We open ourselves up, we be known to other believers to let the love of Christ transform our lives, and we seek to know others, to, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we see this throughout Scripture. Uh, we're going to look here at the one another commands of Scripture. Maybe you've heard about the one another commands. There's many of them in Scripture. What they express is that if you love your neighbor as yourself, it will look like this. It will look like these one another commands. Love looks this way, and these commands require knowing and being known by others ultimately, as we said, because you can't love that which you do not know. These commands describe what Christian community is supposed to look like. What should Christian believers, the relationship we have, look like? Um, One uh, theologian, this is the comment he made on one another relationships that I thought was helpful, and he said, the phrases each other and one another speak to relationships. They do not address a relationship to God or a relationship to oneself. Neither do they speak to a relationship with the universal church. Rather, they address interpersonal relationships within a community of believers. That's what they're there for. And so I want you to notice as we look at some of these on the screen, the closeness required to carry out these commands. Another way to say it would would be following these one another commands is impossible at a a distance. Uh, The first one here, Romans 15, 7, Paul writes, Therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And so we can think about what does it mean to receive one another. And it at least means knowing who someone is and accepting them for who they are in Christ, and receiving them demonstrates a closeness and a certain knowledge of them. Paul also says in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. So he says, I beseech you walk worthy. Then he explains, what does it look like to walk worthy? Well, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another, in love. And so lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love are what's supposed to characterize Christian relationships. And unfortunately, so often, if you can think about times you've interacted with Christians, you know how often, especially in this political climate, 
Is gentleness a mark of our conversations with one another? Not very often, unfortunately. But the love of Christ moves us to these kinds of attitudes and actions with believers that require us to know people and to be known by them and to be okay with it. Ephesians 4.32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Notice the gospel motivation here, um, explicitly gospel motivation. He says, forgive one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So we forgive one another. Why or how? We forgive one another in the way of the gospel, in the way that God through Christ forgave us. Our forgiveness is gospel motivation, and it's a mark of Christian community. And typically, forgiveness happens when sin has happened, when we have been wronged, which requires a level of knowledge. The more you get close to people, the more you know people, the more you see the flaws, the more they see your flaws, and you have greater opportunity for forgiveness because we all mess up in those relationships. Uh, Moving on here, in Colossians 3.13, similarly, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. Notice again, forgiveness, gospel motivation. In James 5.16, confess your trespasses to one another. That's being known. You can't confess hidden trespasses. That wouldn't make sense. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Hebrews 3, 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The implication here is that being hardened through the deceitfulness of sin may happen if you're not exhorted. And people must know you enough to know what to exhort you about. Knowing someone on Sunday morning and shaking their hand in what we used to do, the greeting time, um, is not going to be enough for people to know you well enough to exhort you so that you're not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Similarly, from a positive side in Hebrews 10, 24, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The implication here being that if you do not stir one another up to love and good works, there might be some love and good works that don't happen, and you need to be together, assembling together for that to happen. And so these, you know, commandments require you to be connected to your fellow Christian in a close way. They require me to be connected to my fellow Christians in a close way. And this might be incredibly difficult for you for a number of reasons. If you're an introvert, which typically means that people tired you out, tire you out or exhaust you rather than giving you energy, and you'd rather be alone, this might be difficult for you. It might be difficult for you if you're able to make many surface-level connections but never go deeper with anyone. It'll be difficult for you if you crave this, but it seems like nobody around you does. It'll be difficult for you if you don't seem to have the time to make this kind of commitment. I mean, Jesus spent his life with his disciples Do we have time to spend our life with other believers? Um, There's so many more possible difficulties or reasons that it will be hard for me and hard for you to know and be known by our Christian community. But the love of Christ is the only sufficient motivator for you to push past them. Whether you're introverted, extroverted, shy, bubbly, maybe boring, um, 
We're all called to be closely connected to the church, the people who have been indwelt by the Spirit. And we must remember, too, this is kind of an outside point, but there's a real sense in which we have already been unified by the Spirit as Christians because we all have the same Spirit. And Paul is calling us in these one another commands to live like it, to live like the unified believers that we already are. And I want to spend a little bit of time here towards the end looking at the last one of these one another commandments in a little more detail, especially because this has been one that's been on my mind quite a bit in the last couple of months. In Galatians 6, this is what Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so if we think of this from a perspective of knowing one another and being known, you can see that Knowing and being known is necessary for restoration from sin. And this is because, as we've said, hidden sin cannot be restored by others. And so, be known. Ask, am I overtaken by sin? Is there someone I could share this with? Be willing to know others. Who around me that I already know is being overtaken by sin that I can encourage? Notice here that he says, you who are spiritual, restore. And what does it mean to be spiritual? And, you know, chapter 6 here comes right after chapter 5 of Galatians, which the main point of chapter 5 is walking in the Spirit, is demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. And so to be spiritual is to be a person who is controlled by the Spirit, who walks in the Spirit, who demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, I think goodness, and self-control. Notice here, as we mentioned before, restoration must be gentle. Again, one of the fruit of the Spirit. And notice that restoration is cautious, but not inactive. The Spirit-filled person recognizes the danger of sin, but the danger that he recognizes is not, does not keep him from acting. And this is because we realize as believers that um, we all have the capacity to fall into sin, really any sin. Uh, we stay strong and connected to Christ only by His grace. We also see here that knowing and being known is necessary for getting through our burdens. And this could be burdens such as sin, or it could be other difficulties or suffering in the believer's life. We see here first that bearing burdens fulfills the law of Christ. And this is talking about the love of Christ. If you look here at Galatians 5, 14 through 15, just a couple verses previously, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And why is it that we need to know and be known to bear one another's burdens? Well, simply because you can't bear unknown burdens. And your unknown burdens can't be borne by someone else. And so what is it like? What does it mean to bear burdens? I've thought a lot about this in the past year because of the difficulty that my family has gone through with my brother's epilepsy, which, uh, you know, keep praying for him. I thank you for that. He's in the hospital again, and it just, you know, it gets worse and worse, basically. So in a situation where things get worse and worse, and you can't do anything to help it get better, what do you do? What does it mean to bear burdens, how can you help in that situation? And it's very difficult. Um, At the basic level, we believe that prayer means something and that when we pray, things happen that wouldn't happen if we didn't pray. 
And so we pray, and I thank you all for your prayers. But um, as I have wrestled through it, I've thought I can bear their burdens by encouraging them and reminding them of the Lord and who he is and what he has done and what we know he will do. For me, it's a big part of it has been to listen to them when they're ready to talk, and this sometimes takes wisdom because uh, people aren't always ready to talk, and that's okay. But when they are, listen. Uh, Listening shows that you care and can help uh, people, and I think that's a way that I've been able to help my family. And lastly, you can relentlessly be on the lookout for needs that you could meet, and when you see them, you meet them. You know, so often we say, and I think our hearts are in the right place when we say this, if there's anything I can do, let me know. And the difficulty with that is most people never let you know. But if we have eyes to see people and to, to get to know them in their lives and we're willing to say and to, to relentlessly look for things that we can help with and we just help when we see them, I think we can help people to bear their burdens. Love is driving us to know others with the aim of serving them in Christ, the love of Christ. And it's the only thing that will strengthen us. You know, often I've thought, honestly, and this may be a little bit selfishly, uh, that even the burden of my family is too difficult for me to bear, let alone uh, for them. But it's the love of Christ that is the only strong enough thing to keep me moving forward, to keep them moving forward, to keep us moving forward as we seek to know and be known in our church. And so I want to close here by talking a bit about being known and knowing in our church community. And I have really two things to say about this. Number one, know and be known at the appropriate level of closeness. If you think about Jesus, he knew the crowd first, and then out of the crowd he had the 70 disciples, and then out of those 70 he chose only 12, and out of those 12 he chose only three. And there was different levels of closeness amongst all of those groups. And it's really, it should be the same in our lives. Um, We don't need you, we don't want you to come up here on the pulpit and start sharing your greatest sin to the whole congregation. That's not the kind of being known that Scripture is demonstrating to us through the one another commands. But you do need in your life one or two people who will be close enough that you can share with them anything and everything so that you can be helped and motivated and moved to be more like Christ. And often, this happens, has to happen at the crowd level before you get to the one or two level. You know someone's name through the Sunday service. You get to know them a little closer, maybe through Wednesday night. You know who their family is. You know where they work, so on and so forth. Maybe in life group, it's an even smaller group where you can start talking a bit about life and what is happening in life. And maybe through life group, you're able to connect with one or two people that you can be on the closest level with. So know and be known at the appropriate level of closeness, keeping in mind the humble transparency we talked about previously. And lastly, embrace the risk of knowing and being known. You know, as I said earlier, Jesus, he got close to the crowds. They tried to push him off the cliff. They called for his crucifixion. He was crucified. He was close to his disciples. They betrayed him too. Uh, They forsook him. They denied him repeatedly. Judas explicitly in front of everyone betrayed him. If you think about Paul in the New Testament, this is what Paul says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Paul also says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. These are people Paul had gotten close to, doing him much harm. He even says uh, more powerfully in 2 Timothy 4, 16, at my first defense, no one stood with me. Paul is struggling. He's in a place of difficulty, and none of the Christians stood with him. They all 
forsook him, he says. But then uh, he says after that, may it not be charged against them. How can Paul say, may it not be charged against them? Everyone had just forsook him. And the only way that Paul could say, may it not be charged against them, was because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Only by the love of Christ, only loving like Jesus, will be a sufficient enough motivator for you to pursue close relationships with other believers. Because let me tell you, other believers are going to hurt you, and every time you get close enough to other believers to start sharing who you really are, you are opening yourself up to hurt. And love of Jesus, the love of Jesus is the only motivator that will get you through that for what Christ has for you. And this is what Peter says, talking about Christ. I'll read a smaller portion of it in 1 Peter 2, 21. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. He also says in a couple chapters later, 1 Peter 4, 7, but the end of all things is at hand, Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. And he says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. And so, I just encourage you today, and I'm encouraging myself to love like Jesus. You know, why is it worth it? Why should you try? Why should you start trying, keep trying? Only because of the love of Christ. Only because he loved you so much to send his son to die for you on the cross. And so we're calling you this year to know and be known with us this year through the difficulties of interpersonal relationships. And Uh, In the next year, as we seek to know and be known by our church community, we aim as a church first to grow our life group ministry by 50 people. Um, This is not because we believe life group is a miracle or it's the best program, but it's because the purpose of life group is to provide an environment to facilitate one another relationships. The purpose of Sunday morning is not to do that. The purpose of Sunday morning is to worship together as a church, to, to preach the Word of God and learn what God has told us in His Word. Life Group's purpose is different, and we're trying to be intentional about that this year. And we hope through that ministry that you will get to know people and be able to form those close one-on-one relationships. And in doing that, we also aim this year to start five new life groups so that we can have the space for you to join. And then finally, this year we aim to spend to get time together as a church four times. I almost couldn't bear to write this because we're spending time together as a church right now. But what we mean here is that we are going to intentionally try to have Uh, four times where we can get together to do something fun as a church, whether this is eat food, whether it's, if it's play softball, whether it's go to a, some kind of game or play cornhole, whatever it is, we want to provide opportunities on the crowd level so that you can move and begin to be connected at a surface level and get closer and closer in relationships and connected to other believers. Because I realize, you know, it can be strange, especially if you're an introvert, to just show up at some life group that you uh, know no one. <laughs> um, so I hope this year that you will uh, commit to, to know and be known with us as we seek to love like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the unfathomable example of Christ and his love for us on the cross. And I pray, Lord, that we would commit 
to loving like Jesus, and I pray that we would recognize that it's only possible through depending on you, Lord. We do not have the strength to love like you in our own power, but we need your grace, Lord, and I pray that you'd give it to us and that we would take meaningful steps towards you, Lord. Um, In Jesus' name I pray, amen.